Hi there, I'm Mr Arkinstall and uh, I'm here to deliver the second video looking at Britain and the Western Front. This is particularly important when we think about um, medicine and in particular the LXL course, but obviously the content from this video will hopefully help you with a variety of different content that you need. I'm here again dressed in my uh, major's outfit to uh, set the tone and set the scene as we delve ourselves into video two, which is looking at trenches. Behind me, uh, courtesy of the wonderful Richard Broadhead from Wiltshire Soldiers, uh, I've got a wonderful trench map here, and uh, I'll come to the map a little bit later. But the main idea behind this video is to look at why trenches were built, what were, they, uh, what were the design features of them, and most importantly, how did that affect the health of soldiers that were in them? So first of all, why the trenches in the first place? With, with most fighting, especially in the First World War, the aim was to try and push your enemy away as, as far as possible. For the Germans, they're trying to follow the sleeping plan, which is to arch through Belgium, attack Paris, and then go and hit Russia. Um, the only issue we've got here is that both uh, Russia and France are ready for this fight, and they're both attacking um, Germany at the same time. So Germany fails, really, to get the sleeping plan going. They were going to knock out Paris in six weeks, and that just doesn't happen. What then happens is the following. Um, after a series of early fighting skirmish battles in uh, 1914, both sides used trenches and they dig trenches to try and avoid being shot at. And that's the main principle of a trench, to defend. For um, By the end of the 1914, both sides had realised that they weren't going anywhere quickly due to the technology and due to the vast numbers of men that were deployed on the Western Front in particular. So uh, a series of, uh, so by 1915, this stalemate, this inability to outflank the enemy, meant that they were digging multiple networks of trenches. I mean, this just gives you a small example of how vast the trench systems were. We're not just talking one series of trenches dug into the ground, but lots of them. You, um, you've got your frontline trench, your reserve trench, uh, your communication trenches, um, all connecting uh, and, and across quite a wide front. You know, in this case, you've got the German positions here. This is um, the Somme, uh, Beaumont, Hammond and Ticken in Tietbal. Uh, and you can see how far back they go. Equally with the British ones, you've got frontline trenches and various trenches going backwards. And then these would be connected via um, little small train lines that would build fascinating information here. But let's go back to the reason why they were dug in the first place. So because of this stalemate, uh, a long line of trenches were dug, in fact, from the North Sea all the way down to the Swiss border. That was specifically... In, um, in Western Europe. So I've got a map here which will explain a little bit more about the location of that. So thank you very much for the, for the map. So this map you can see here, right at the top, you've got uh, the North Sea. And as that red line marches its way through France, you can see how far the, the Germans had bulged into France. Um, we've got a tiny toehold up in, in Belgium here, which had been held by the British Expeditionary Force. And that was the first, first Battle of Ypres. We held on to that. But, but then as, as this snakes all the way down, you can see the Germans had occupied pretty much most of Belgium and this section here of France. And obviously this is quite a crude map. But what it's trying to show you is that there was a, a series of trenches. It's not one long line. It's a series of trenches that, that interconnect up there. And the next picture that I want to show you is this. This is a detail from a trench manual. It's a guide for trench warfare. Trench warfare is a standard practice and it's still used today in the British Armed Forces. And the idea is to try and create a, um, a, a, a fortified position that can be held. The idea for the British was they, they were going to stay in these trenches for a short amount of time before they then launched their attacks against the Germans. <coughs> for the Germans, they were aiming to hold these positions, so the trenches were much more complicated. And in fact, um, if we have a look at some of these images here, this one here shows you um, the British trench. We know this is 1916 because, or at least after 1916, due to the... Um, nature of the um, equipment that they're wearing. But here you, we can see things like the sandbags. These men are actually having their, their feet inspected by a medical orderly. It's more than likely for, for um, infection. Notice the mud and the height as well. And these are the German trenches, just to give you a comparison. And the German trenches had got, um, uh, they were much more complicated because they were designed to hold that territory for as much as possible. And here we could see the, um, the, the German military equipment. Notice the steps and so on that they've got. OK, so we've talked a little bit about why they were needed. It was to defend. Uh, for the Germans, they were holding territory. For the British, the French and the Belgians, they were using them merely as a springboard to push the Germans back out. Um, 
There are various different uh, photographs you can find online, and it's really worth having a look at these photographs of what the trench systems looked like. They were incredibly complex in some places. Some places they were far away as, um, as, a, as a tennis court. You could actually throw grenades from one to another. In Gallipoli, uh, the Turks were, who were fighting against the predominantly Australians and New Zealanders, um, with, with the British as well, they found that the quarters were incredibly close. At one point, they're on top of a hill, and uh, they're so close that they can hear each other shouting. And again, they can throw things from one trench to the other. To some extent, they are vast distances uh, apart as well. In, in this case here, which we will zoom in on in a moment, you've got a, a wood system here, which has been occupied by the British forces in France. And then up here, unfortunately, you can't see the topography. This is the high ground up here. This is the village of Thiepval. And... Uh, you can see here that uh, the, the, the frontline trench really just pokes its way outside the wood uh, and it's not too far away here from the German front line. Yet from here to here, it's a greater distance. And it'll be down to the topography of the land, so what the kind of the, the undulations, the, the lumps and bumps of the ground look like. Uh, here is another example of an aerial photograph that was taken. And this shows you here um, the German positions, slightly more crenellated, slightly more detailed and, and in depth. And then this I thought was a great little photograph which shows you uh, an example of what trenches might look like today. This one is out in France. This is at Newfoundland Park. Wonderful because you can see the, the shell craters here still, but you can also still see that, that zigzagging here. Okay, brilliant. Right, so let's now talk about the features of the trenches and what they actually look like. The trench system, interestingly, wasn't just one line. There was no real point in, in, in creating a line like that. You want to make these trenches um, as, as intricate as possible. And the simple reason why is because you don't want an enemy to jump into a trench, either with a machine gun or a flamethrower, and just be able to shoot straight down the line. Equally, if you're being attacked by artillery and shells are dropping on you, what you don't want is the shells exploding and taking out huge sections. So by zigzagging your trench, a bit like the photograph we've seen, a bit like this one, and in particular this one, by zigzagging, it means that if one section gets completely hit, that the shock won't be taken by the rest of the trench, and you can still continue that. Equally, trenches weren't just one deep, there were usually three different layers, and um, at the front, you would usually have your frontline trench. You weren't supposed to be in the frontline trench for long, um, possibly a week, and that depends on diaries and accounts that you get hold of. Um, then you would come back to your, um, um, your support trench. Support trench was really for reserves. So once the frontline men had gone over the top, so, so to speak, to go and attack an enemy position, the next line would come from behind, so the support trench would bring up. And then you have a reserve line trench at, at the back. So you have three lines worth of defence here. And they all uh, would be facing the enemy. And then running parallel to that, so running in a different direction, you would have your communication trenches and these would allow men, equipment and supplies like food to be brought up and down, down the line. Just to show you a picture so we can get a better idea of what this looked like. Uh, I've got a, an image here and this shows you the um, wonderful kind of simplicity, I suppose, of the, the trench system. But at the front, you can see here your frontline trench and we'll talk a little bit about how that was set up. Notice you've got these little boards running across the top, which would allow men from behind and certainly from, from the other side to, to get over. It also provides an element of shelter as well from attack. You've then got your communication trench, like I said, which is running uh, the, the alternative way, this way, allowing you to move easily from one to the other. And then from the support trench, you would go towards a, a reserve trench as well. Underneath, so underground, you would have these little dugouts, which is what you would probably see in Blackadder. And then on, on top, you would have um, various different features like barbed wire to try and protect the positions. Now let's have a quick look at a cross section of trench. These are the most important features to try and remember. At the top, the top part of the trench, the flat bit at the top, is known as the parapet. The, the same equivalent behind you will be known as the parados. So parapet, parados. Here's the dugout that I mentioned. It could be um, made quite simply. Or it could be made out of great amounts of um, detail with iron and, and, and wooden supports and so on. The dugout was somewhere where officers would hang out to, um, to make their plans and, 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 and um, 
and ideas. But equally at the same time, this would probably be a place where the men would, would, would hold up. There was also something known as a funk hole or a bolt hole. And this would be something like a little hole in the, um, in the ground, in the um, side of the trench, which would allow you to put items like ammunition and so on and so forth to protect it from weather and to get easy access to it. Now, one of the issues with trenches is that they would fill up with water. And so these things here, duck boards, more or less do exactly what they say on the tin, allow you to walk across your trench without getting your feet wet. Because one of the things you don't want is to spend a week in wet, muddy conditions where you adjust, your feet just uh, sit in water. And I'll talk about the problems that causes in a moment. At the top, though, we have the barbed wire. This was usually incredibly thick, um, maybe seven, 10 metres, 30 metres in places thick of barbed wire. And, uh, and that primarily you've got um, your, uh, your main features. The other one to mention is the fire step just there. And if you were going to fire out onto um, or, or certainly get a, a leg up to get a, a bit of an idea what's going on, that's what the fire step's there for, to step on it to fire. Now, you don't want to be looking above the trench and the idea of the trench is that it is actually above you. So when you go out to the battlefield sites and you, and you see these trenches that are, are waist height and so on, it's simply because they've sunk and they've not been supported since they were first built. But the trench was designed for defence, as I've already said, and all of these features are doing that. One of the things that was actually created for the First World War was the periscope, which allowed you to use mirrors to see above the ground so that you could have a quick look up without getting your head shot off. So we've got the fire step, which we've talked about. We've got the uh, barbed wire, which was a defensive feature. There'll be holes in the barbed wire, which would allow your men to get up and to get out to, to go and attack. The only problem in some cases was if the Germans had the high ground and could position their machine guns at your entry point or, or, or exit point, they've got a, a very good line of fire. And that was one of the issues we had um, in places like the, the Somme, which I've got behind me. OK, so the main features of the trench are all designed for protection. And um, as I've mentioned, things like the duck boards to get your feet out of the water. Now, it's made from mud and it's made from wood. You um, would deposit your spoil or soil to create defensive features as well. And, um, you know, various complicated trenches. You'll see the various different complicated features added to trenches. But that's more or less the basics. If you were to Google them or to have a look at other videos, you'll, you'll see kind of... Um, the kind of trenches that were built in uh, France that are based on using the chalk as a great feature. We certainly know that Arras used a lot of chalk under its, in its, well, in its quarry, Wellington quarry, to hide soldiers. For the Germans though, they actually brought concrete in to help their trench system. And um, places like Messines, you've got two bunkers up on the hill there where the Germans had control. And both cases you can see where concrete blocks had more or less been made prefabricated and were slotted in to create these little pillboxes and, and uh, trench systems and then later on they, they uh, de developed this way of being able to pour the concrete straight in to create quite a rigid structure as well which made it more difficult to attack okay so um what what have we got that is that is causing the, the biggest problems i suppose so we've talked about the nature of trenches and what they look like they're usually in three levels uh, they've got a communication trench, we know that they're zigzagged, um, we know about the dugouts, we know about all those different features. So what is it that's causing the problems? Well, I kind of whittled it down to um, about four problems, really. One, let's think about the nature of the trench itself. Trenches themselves were um, six metres wide, sometimes seven metres high to try, and, to try and cover the height. So if you think about the width of that, that could potentially be the width of two people two people crossing each other. Now imagine in a busy battle where you've got a stretcher, which is incredibly heavy and quite, um, and quite cumbersome because they fold out, and that's been handed down to you so that you can then carry that through a trench. Now you'd have to have one person minimum, one person behind carrying. To some extent, in some places, you'd have to have more. In the Battle of Passchendaele, um, there are records saying there were six or seven men to actually one man to transport them through the mud because of the nature of the, of the soil. Anyway, one problem you've got is transport and movement in these trenches. It's not very easy. So it's pretty difficult if you've got lots of men flooding up to the front line and equally the wounded coming back. Equally, they can't hide from the fact that they're seeing so many wounded come back. <coughs> so they're very thin. It's very difficult to manoeuvre a stretcher whilst men are coming at you. Number two, 
Another problem you've got, as I've mentioned, is the rain. So as it's raining, depending on the soil type, so if it's somewhere like Passchendaele in Belgium, <coughs> soil is incredibly clay, thick, water will seep in and it becomes boggy. If you are sat in the water for too long, you'll get something known as trench foot. And I haven't um, shown pictures of that because I just think it's pretty horrible. Um, and, and what happens is it's, um, it's something that actually happens when your foot starts to um, wrinkle up. So your foot will absorb a lot of water anyway. But if you're sat in that and uh, there's friction and your, your foot's rubbing, you'll get an infection in it. Eventually what will happen is the circulation will stop going to, um, to, to your extremities and uh, they'll, they'll become black. And then what will happen is they'll, they'll drop off. Pretty horrible things to happen whilst you're out there. So a lot of men struggled to, to actually get their garments dry, especially if it was raining constantly. So trying to get a, a, um, a fire going is definitely not going to happen in the front line trench because Germans will be able to pinpoint where you are. So you'd have to do that a little bit further back. So trying to stay dry was difficult and trying to get your feet out of it was also quite hard. Another thing that was going to cause you problems was disease. Now, there are various things causing disease. One, death. Bodies that are out in no man's land. Flies are going to be landing on those bodies and then they're going to be landing on your food or even on you. At the same time, in hotter places, you'll have um, things being spread like malaria um, from mosquitoes. Again, illnesses being spread from, from animals that are digesting dead bodies. The rats equally would ca carry diseases and uh, rats, you know, the famous fact is that rats were the size of cats and these things would sit on your shoulder perhaps or at night nibble away at your feet. But they were prevalent in trenches <clears throat> and they would kind of move where the humans moved as well. Um, you've also got another problem with the fact that you can't clean yourself because you're sat in one of these um, trenches for possibly a week. It's, it, it doesn't tend to be too long, but even that means that you haven't got the ability to bathe or shower or keep yourself clean. Regulation stated that you needed to keep yourself um, trim whilst on duty, so you had to shave a bit of rainwater. Um, if you had the luxury of a bit of soap, you'd probably uh, lather that up and then shave. But anything else, you're just going to accumulate sweat. And places that lice would like to go would be um, hot, uh, moist areas of the body, so under armpits, near the groin, under the neck. Um, that's They would lay their eggs in your uniform equally they will be itchy and, and made from wool anyway and um, and one of the things that soldiers would try and do is they would try and uh, de-louse themselves to try and avoid infection. Um, typhus would have been caused by things like this and trench fever was also caused by this as well, quite serious things to happen whilst you're in these conditions and uh, the phrase to have a chat actually comes from when the soldiers would sit together and they would sit by the fire running the seams over um, the fire to try and pop the eggs or using a hot spoon or um, a needle or something like that to try and pull the, the lice the eggs out of your uniform. Whilst they were doing that, they would talk. But the actual idea of de-lousing was known as chatting. And that's where we get that phrase from today. Fascinating fact. Um, another issue that you've got would be the, um, the weaponry that's being fired at you. Artillery is coming down. If that bursts or breaks apart, You've got shrapnel, which would land or rain down on you. So if you could get into a dugout, if you couldn't find shelter under one of those um, um, corrugated iron bridges, then you were, you were going to be exposed to that. There's bullets uh, flying around as well, machine gun bullets, rifle bullets, sniper bullets, uh, and those could cause damage to human bodies as well. So it was important to kind of keep your head down whilst moving through trench systems. And then I suppose we've talked about shrapnel, we've talked about that. The final thing, I suppose, in the trenches was diet. It was very important to try and keep healthy, especially whilst fighting. <coughs> but one other issue was trying to make sure you got the right food. And food was a difficult thing to get into trenches sometimes. Um, bully beef was that famous thing that was, was brought up, was like tinned corned beef. Lots of tinned goods were brought up. And um, horrifically for water, that was a, a difficult thing to try and get to frontline troops. Water would sometimes be brought up in what was known as a jerry can, like a, a petrol can. Uh, sometimes they didn't wash the jerry cans out, so you'd get this taste of petrol whilst you were, you, were, you were having a drink. So any opportunities you could get to relax when you went back from the frontline trench was important. And remember, 45%, of, and here's an interesting fact really, 45% of soldiers' time was actually spent away from trenches rather than in them. And um, the vast majority of uh, records that I remember reading about quite recently was, over, was about how soldiers found that most of their time in trenches, they were quite bored. They would sketch or write poetry to send home. So it wasn't constant fighting, it wasn't everywhere that this was happening. 
and that was another myth to try and to try and get rid of. Um, <coughs> right behind the lines would actually be your artillery, and that's one of the things that I forgot to add in your um, your trench system. And in certain cases, you might also find um, concrete houses or, or bunk houses or pillboxes, as they called them, where a machine gun would be placed inside. Uh, but those were all kind of designed to protect the artillery and to protect the soldiers that, that were there on that ground. OK, before we finish, then, I wanted to give you a bit of a close up look at the map so you can see what this thing actually looks like. And then I'm going to show you a small clip from 1917, which hopefully will give you a better idea of what the trenches look like. So if we zoom in a little bit, that's great. This is Beaumont Hamel. <coughs> so Beaumont Hamel is just here. And this is where Newfoundland Park that I mentioned earlier is based. And then as we uh, you can see, the trench system goes all the way down, all the way down here to Tietvel. And in fact, what I am going to do is I'm going to just bring you a tiny bit closer so we can have a look at this. So let's focus on this particular area. You can see here features like the wood and you can see a little bit of gradient. So these these lines here, you can see denotes the fact that, that this, this is a hill. So as, as the numbers get higher, you're getting higher up. And in France, it wasn't particularly high, the land, but any kind of lump bump hill worked. So if you notice on this one here, again, the numbers are going up, which means that this is the high ground. So the Germans have got this. So let's go back down to the wood. Let's get down to Tietvel. Right, let's have a look at the German defences. So what you've got here is uh, this really tightly zigzagged, look, trench line. So that is a trench line that's running along here. So it snakes down here and then it comes down at a right angle and then takes another uh, pot, uh, pass down here. It's facing opposite the wood, which is where the British positions were. The Wiltshire Regiment, which is one of our um, uh, closest regiments, were, was based. They, they were in here at some point during the battle. Uh, and then if we stay with the Germans, notice then they've got their communication line going this way. Then they've got another trench here, another trench here, a communication trench going down here. And then you've still got a network of trenches that are running behind here, where it's got this line of apple trees. Now, in Tietval, it was a small village at the time, and there was a manor house or a chateau based around here. The chateau, unfortunately, was shelled and completely destroyed by, by us. But in the basement, they, um, they, they, they held out and that was used as a position. A bit further back, you then have a place called Muquet Farm, Farm de Muquet. This was a big artillery position. Uh, and this was also a, a trench line that needed to be taken, which was eventually taken near the end of the Battle of the Somme. Uh, but notice the distance here from, from here to the German front positions there. Same thing happens when we look at the British line. So the British line, you can notice that ours aren't as zigzag as the Germans. We have our communication line trenches going this way, and we have a circuit of trenches running here which basically follow the lines of the wood. The wood itself is fascinating if you ever get a chance to go in. But behind here, we've got a nice little defensive feature, some water. This looks like a river that runs along here as well. And what would happen is a, um, a train line, a small train line would be brought up to bring supplies up to the soldiers here. So it, it just gives you a small idea of what the uh, trench system looked like, the map system, and look at how far away the British and the Germans actually were. And if you Google these trench maps, they are work. They're really interesting to study, really interesting, because if you notice, they've tried to make them a little bit more homely by naming things like Haymarket, um, Limerick Avenue, Wellington Road, or Wellington Trench, Shaftesbury Avenue here. So they tried to Piccadilly Junction or Piccadilly, Piccadilly, St. James, Constitution Hill, Hyde Park Corner. So they've all got familiar names to make them feel as homely as possible. But obviously they were far from homely. Thank you very much for um, paying attention to this uh, video, which is looking at trench conditions. And uh, our next one, we'll start to look at some of the problems that soldiers faced when they were out on the Western Front. Thank you.